who used to travel through space in primitive galleons. Then we used flying saucers. Now we use silver spaceships. Clueless earthlings have finally realized that alien civilization is making rapid progress. Let's see what your parents and grandparents thought about alien civilization. Now we've looked at the ideas that we have had in antiquity and through the Middle Ages in Europe about aliens. Now let's have a look at ideas about aliens in the 20th century, particularly the earliest 20th century. Now, here is H.G. Wells, and he wrote a very well-known book called War of the Worlds in 1898. And in this book, there are monsters that come from Mars and going to take over the Earth. So here's a picture of one of those monsters. It's got a ray gun, and here's some sinking ship, uh, presumably sunk by the monster. And here's a more modern version of something similar. Again, H.G. Wells inspired this. Now, H.G. Wells in 1901 wrote a book called The First Men in the Moon. And here are the two men who went to the moon. And here are the inhabitants of the moon. They're called Selenites. And here they are in their beautiful city walking on these walkways. And here's an image of the two men looking at the Selenites and saying, Insects? Are they insects? And that's what they look like. So H.G. Wells thought the inhabitants of the moon were kind of like insects. Now, in 1908, H.G. Wells wrote a piece called The Things That Live on Mars. And here's an image of the things that might live on Mars. And he wrote, there are certain features in which they are likely to resemble us. And as likely as not, they will be covered with feathers or fur. It is no less reasonable to suppose, instead of a hand, a group of tentacles or proboscis-like organs. Now, Giovanni Schiaparelli, he lived until 1910, and he looked at Mars very, very closely during times of the year when Mars was very close to the Earth. And based on his observations, he made maps like this, and he called these little lines canali, and which translates roughly into canals. And uh, um, an American, Percival Lowell, a rich guy, he took this word canali very seriously, and he made a map that looks like this, and he thought these were irrigation canals because Mars was drying out and the Martians need to move water around. And so, but when you compare modern pictures of, from the Hubble Space Telescope of Mars with these uh, pictures from 100 years earlier, you can see that they don't correspond. There, there are no canals on Mars. Now, Alfred Russell Wallace was the co-founder of Darwinism. And in the year 1903, he wrote a book called Man's Place in the Universe, trying to figure out how does man fit into the universe. And he thought that the sun was in a very special place in the galaxy. Uh, there was some evidence for that at the time he wrote. But he went even a lot further. He, he wrote, humanity's place in the universe is special and probably unique. The supreme end and purpose of this vast universe was the production and development of the living soul in the perishable body of man. So that's one view of humanity's place in the universe by the co-founder of Darwinism. Now, here's another view. He's an artist, Frank R. Paul, one of the renowned artists of the early 20th century. And he, wrote, he made pictures like this of, of uh, human astronauts. They have those big helmets on, and they're being chased here by an alien that looks like a buzzsaw. And they're quickly running for cover inside of their spaceship. But luckily, humans have ray guns that, to protect themselves from such aliens. And he wrote a whole series of pictures of the inhabitants of the different planets of our solar system. So, so for example, here on the lower left, you'll see the, the inhabitants there red of the quartz city on Mercury. And then there are the inhabitants of Venus. Obviously, they're bipedal and they're waving hello. And if you read carefully, it says, a scientific conception of life on Earth's nearest neighbor. Science says, 
Venus is a sister world and human forms of life are more possible than on any other planet. Now this was in 1939 and we really have made a lot of progress in figuring out and now we know that Venus is so hot, it's hotter than you can make your own oven and so that uh, make, probably makes life <laughs> impossible. Now here's a man from Mars and notice that very giant, looks like a mosquito of some kind but it's bipedal. And here are the bipedal teardrops who live on some astro asteroid. And uh, then there's life on Jupiter. Now, we know now that Jupiter does not have a surface because it's a gaseous planet, but we didn't know that when he drew this in 1940 or so. And he says that the gravity is so strong that humans, to get around, they have to live inside of tractors, and the inhabitants of, of uh, Jupiter are so strong that they're kind of, uh, they have to have very, very, very strong legs to walk around. Now here's life on Io, which is a, a, a moon of Jupiter, very close. That's why Jupiter in the background is so big. And you can see these are bipedal, look a little bit like penguins. And the guy has a rifle in case things get out of control. And then there's an, I think this is a life on Europa. And these guys, <laughs> these guys these look like Halloween costumes here. But I guess the astronaut has just killed some kind of beast. Now then there's life on Ganymede. And now here's where the cat women live. And uh, yes, they seem to be attacking this, uh, this human astronaut here. And then on another, there's another moon called Callisto, and these look like the Indian monkey people. They seem to have four arms. They, they too are bipedal, like the cat women on Ganymede. Then there's life on Saturn. Here they look more like insects, giant insects. And then there's life on Titan, which is essentially a brontosaurus in a swamp, eating people and then being shot at by the astronauts. Then there's the city of Neptune, in which you have the reptile men in the lower right. You can see them. They look a little like cats. And then you have <coughs> uh, stories about planets around Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a, a red giant in the constellation Orion. And I guess this is what uh, one of their planets looked like. There are also stories in which the aliens are not animals, but they're more like plants. And here's like a Venus flytrap giant man-eating alien. And then we have here some, I guess these are <laughs> walking, some kind of flower plant people. And they're, I'm not sure what they're going to do to this uh, drunk scientist of some kind. Then there are aliens looking, scrutinizing humanity. Say, what kind of beings are these, these humans? And then uh, here they are scrutinizing two men in a cage, kind of like they're making films of them, like Hollywood directors. But also, the people sometimes were scrutinizing the aliens. So here's a gigantic headed, it must be very intelligent, but uh, he looks kind of scrawny. Uh, now, one of the main images of this Pulp Fiction are, is of brave men saving scantily clad women from aliens. So here he guys with a gray gun trying to kill the monster that's taking his woman. Here's another image of the same thing. The man on the right says, hey, you ant, let go of my woman. <coughs> now. I think that for several million years, bands of human hunter-gatherers defended themselves from the midnight raids of neighboring bands coming to kill men and steal women. Think, for example, modern examples of ISIS and the Yazidis. Now, these Pulp Fiction images, I think, bear witness to what several million years will do to a brain. <coughs> so on the right, you can see these aliens taking away a woman and then the good guys on the upper left with their shooting bows and having a spear fight with the blue bed blue people. Here's another image of an alien taking away a woman. And here's another alien about to a predator on this helpless woman. And here's a really evil monster taking away a woman and a man trying to save a woman in a yellow dress from this reptilian alien. And here's some more. There's some kind of bug-like alien attacking a woman, and then another bug carrying away a woman, and then the man saving his woman from the white-skinned people. And then there's a, some kind of alien octopus chasing this woman. And there's the chicken man running away with a woman, and the astronauts on the left trying to say, hey, give us back our woman. And here's some type of, of a reptilian alien threatening a woman. Now, women <clears throat> sometimes contribute to their own defense. <clears throat> so in these three images, we have women who are also defending themselves. And sometimes women don't need the help of men. For example, this strong woman with a ray gun, obviously in control of the situation. 
Sometimes the women get out of hand like this fiery redhead that need to be roped and put into some kind of ca cage. So, <laughs> otherwise, they'll destroy the rocket ship or something. Now, movies also played a part in our images. And The Day the Earth Stood Still came out in 1951. And there's the robot on the left. And they came to Earth to try to save us from ourselves, I think. I think they were not successful. But they were kind of threatening. But even more threatening were this Invasion of the Saucer Men, a movie from 1957. And you can see the theme of running away with a scantily clad woman was part of that movie. In fact, here is the, here is the, the alien ripping at the shoulders of a helpless woman. And just to know that this is Hollywood, here is the midget and the head that was used to create the alien. And that's the woman who was threatened. Yes, the aliens have made rapid progress. 50 Earth years ago, all we wanted was your women. Now, we want your entire planet. 